First, what is green chemistry? What is invention education? How are these two things related? Um, then we're gonna go into more of our house, talk about some examples of invention and green chemistry, seeing how it looks in industry. And then talking about how this green chemistry can be incorporated into classrooms. What type of resources allow us to do this? What work has already been done by teachers that we can replicate? So we're hoping to be really informative um, I also want to start right off the bat. If anyone has questions, always feel free to ask. The chat is a great place to do that. We'll also make time at the end for more questions. So a little bit about Beyond the Nine. We are a nonprofit that's dedicated to green chemistry education, community building. Um, and as we mentioned, well, I guess I didn't mention, but we were co-founded by uh, Dr. John Warner and Dr. Amy Cannon, who um, John Warner is one of the co-founders of the field of green chemistry, and we're located um, now across the country um, and internationally with our staff, but our, our headquarters, I guess, if you will, are, is in uh, Massachusetts. Um, we ha have resources for educators in the K-12 and in higher education space. So we've got a lot of open access resources. We do professional development for educators. And essentially at the organization, we have this vision where we're all about trying to build a sustainable future and by cultivating future leaders who are going to be those inventors, consumers, you know, business advocates who are all about creating sustainable inventions and utilizing the tools of green chemistry to make safer products and processes. And this actually really lays out our theory of change. And as you can see, we find that K-12 is really at the heart of what is going to able, what is going to enable us to create a sustainable future, you know, with better health and, um, and you know, economic outcomes for, for the planet, really. And once we can get students excited in those early ages, we think that that has this ripple effect. So when we're training educators to empower students to get excited about this, then this, you know, it transfers right over into higher education and where that's where the research is happening. And again, the applications of green chemistry in greener tech and all of those, you know, safer products and processes. So, so yeah, that's a little of our, our theory of change and green, green chemistry, you know, K-12 is really at that, at that core. And it's so vital that we've got, you know, educators like you guys here today um, to help us to, to spread the word. As a, sorry, I, I was thinking I was turning back over to Janie, but not yet. Um, so at, at Beyond Benign, we love to use the mantra by teachers and for teachers. And you can see here, we've got our teachers who are a part of a lead teacher program, as well as certified lead teachers. And these are our green chemistry ambassadors. These are our teachers who are in the classrooms, practicing green chemistry with their students, and then disseminating the information and sharing peer to peer in our workshops. They're the ones who help lead our, our whether we're doing in-person or online trainings. Um, and they're really the heart and soul of the K-12 programming. So, so for any educators on there who are, I guess, and I'll just, I'll, I'll end with any educators that are on here and who are, who have started practicing green chemistry with their students and are doing that work, um, you know, beyond benign, we, we invite you, invite you to, to apply and, and become a lead teacher because this is a program that we're, you know, basically always constantly looking for, for new leaders to come into the folds to help share the message. And here at Oregon, we're just really, you know, just at the cusp, just starting out of, of growing a green chemistry education community. It's a good note, Kate. Uh, so that's the little bit of background about who Beyond Benign is, what is the type of work we're trying to do. This is, I thought we could take a moment to do a little bit of goal setting of what we want to do in the next 15 minutes together. These are all feedback from the surveys you guys filled out ahead of time. I also want to say if anyone wants to write a different type of goal or something else that has come to brain, feel free to put that into the chat. 
this is what we're centering around of people were looking to teach more sustainability in the classroom. They want a green perspective about teaching in a virtual space with more simple supplies. Where's green chemistry and curriculum that's ready to be implemented into the classroom? Are there new ideas around teaching general chemistry to keep it more interesting and engaging, um, help to promote it in schools and how to deal with highly hazardous chemicals in storerooms? We'll go through that too. Um, ways to reduce chemical or carbon footprints and access to curriculum and insights into teaching chemistry. I'm hoping that this rings true for most of you, that this sounds like the right things. Let us know if there's other things you want us to cover or other questions you have for us that aren't in this. But I love these notes that you guys gave us during the survey. They're really helpful. And I think we're going to be able to tick a few of these boxes together. Cool. What we're gonna start with too from the survey too is um, what is green chemistry? The knowledge is all over the place. So let's take a moment to explain it a little bit further. I really like to explain it through storytelling. I think it's a bit interesting. And I wanna ask you guys, does anyone know the story of the Mad Hatter? I'm gonna look at all your little screens to see if anyone's nodding. Yeah, a few nods. Yeah, yeah, I feel like it's a good story. So if I miss anything, feel free to add notes in. But it's stories about people who are hatters. They were making hats. And what they wanted to do was make that brim really stiff. Um, so that way it's a more functional hat. Rain doesn't get into your eyes. The sun doesn't get into your eyes. Can anyone tell us what they were using to make the brims of the hats stiff? Maybe put it in the chat. I might need Kate to help me out if it ever gets yep. in there. Yep, we got, we got Sandy answering Mercury. Woohoo! <laughs> winner, winner, chicken dinner! Yeah, exactly. They use mercury to make the hat stiff. But what do we know about mercury is that it's not good for the brains. It's really toxic. And that's why people were being called mad hatters. They were having neurological issues because of the mercury being used. It was an impact from um, the product of having that brim straight. It was having an unintended consequence. There's a lot of unintended consequences that since we know better, we do better. So mercury in thermometers, do we do that anymore? Do we do it regularly anymore? Not so much. Lead in paint, lead in pencils. We've come up with other solutions to still achieve the goals of taking temperatures, painting walls, and writing without having to use these hazardous substances. In the same way that we no longer use mercury in the brims of hats, we found other ways to do this because there was unintended consequences. We did not design these products to cause hazards. We just wanted them to do those simple jobs of making that stiff brim. So because we knew how to do things better, well, we changed the chemicals we used and we used different things. The same is true for the way that we're doing experiments. If we know how to do things in a better way in the chemical laboratory, we're going to change it in doing that because we wanna decrease the overall risk that we're experiencing by having the same outcomes though. We still want that brim of the hat to be stiff. We just do it in different ways. The ways that we often see this in labs is that we often deal with exposure, right? We put on gloves, we put on coats. That way we have less risk. The way that we were able to change a lot of these other reactions is that we change the hazards. We don't use the mercury in the brims of hats. We change the reactions we do to have the same product so that that risk is also decreased. Hazard and exposure are both important, but if we're able to address hazard, we're able to nip it in the butt a bit more. So as you can see here, the risk equation is hazard times exposure. And the way that we think about this in green chemistry is that it's really the only science we're focusing on reducing or eliminating those intrinsic hazards, the hazards that we start with when we do the reaction. It's because of this that chemists and material scientists have the greatest potential to impact pollution prevention by inventing solutions, by coming up with new ways. There had to be a person who came up with hey, let's not use mercury, let's use something else. And how much potential does that make for new inventions in the chemistry world? Cool, any questions on that? Sound good? So now the definition of green chemistry is the design of chemical products and processes that reduce or eliminate the use of hazardous substances. A lot of words in there, we can break it down to be benign by design. When we design something, when we first create that chemical product or process, 
we're thinking about those intrinsic hazards and we want to reduce or eliminate them. In other words, we think about cost, safety, and performance. We want it to be able to perform at the same level that we want it to have a job done, like have that stiff brim, to be able to paint the walls, to be able to write with pencils. It can't be a crazy expensive cost. If using something new was really costly, no one would do it, but we need to be able to do these all while focusing on safety, doing it in a more safe way for us and the environment. So it's in between that cost, safety, and performance. That's the sweet spot for green chemistry. That's where green chemistry is being done when all three are being met. So to zoom out a little bit, I want to ask you guys some questions on have you ever avoided a reaction because of its hazards? You can put into the chat. Um, have you ever subbed a dangerous reaction out? Have you ever decided, mm, I don't want to teach that one. It sounds too risky. Have you ever used smaller quantities of a reaction because of the waste it produces? You had students work in groups, so you wouldn't have to have each one do it individually. I'm seeing some nodding, hopefully. Maybe some people are putting in the chat, yes. The unfortunate part about sharing my screen is that I can't see your chat, but I have full faith that things are happening. I will say there's lots of head nodding for sure. So, <laughs> and thank you, David, for putting in a yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> yes to all those from Kate. So, so yeah, I, I, for sure, people are relating to, to these questions and per into making decisions along these lines. Awesome. Yeah. So Sorry, Jamie, I just want to share this one really great, um, from Christina. Yes. Don't need explosions happening in the classroom. Um, so yeah. And brand new teacher. Yep. No. <laughs> No, not yet. So great. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, Kate. And so what we just want to get out here is that if you're thinking about these things, you're already thinking about green chemistry, you're already putting it into practice in your classroom, you're already trying to be benign by design by laying out what you're doing with your students doing it in a more benign way. So we really applaud you for doing that. And it's amazing how many people have already taken the first step. And so, so building off that and building off the strengths and sort of identifying that, you know, many of you are already likely, you know, taking steps to be practicing green chemistry and, and really thinking about it through that lens. Um, so we recently through a partnership with the um, really with the Boston Museum of Science um, and through support from the Lemelson Foundation, we were able to learn and connect with this really great program that was an NSF research designed program that aligned with the American Chemical Society um, called Chem, basically Chem Attitudes was the, is the name of the project. And what they did is they created a framework for exploring chemistry. So, right, let's do chemistry was, was the tagline. And while this was developed by the National Informal Science Education Foundation, it's, you'll, you'll see, and I, I think make these strong connections of how the, their research, basically what it found is that when you're starting to think about your design strategy structures, your facilitation techniques, you have this ability to magnify and increase interest, grow relevance and self-efficacy when it comes to chemistry, um, when you're doing these hands-on activities in a way that connects um, the context. So Janie, I'm gonna have you skip to the next slide for me, please. Yeah, so this, again, I, I just want you to think about in your practice as educators, as formal educators, you know, we, we get this great training in how to engage students and what does it mean to like deepen understanding? You know, how are you getting at that? A lot of this sounds a lot like NGSS cross-cutting con concepts and, you know, it's, it's the asking of the why and getting at, you know, why is it that I'm doing this, this reaction? Why am I having to learn about chemistry? Um, how does it connect to the real world? What are those real world applications? So the, the really interesting and exciting components of the chem attitude frameworks 
blend really well along the same lines with work that's being done in invention education. So Jamie, I'm gonna have you flip to the next slide, please. And invention education is this growing field where we think about the student-centered approach that's empowering students to solve problems that they care about. Now, you know, if you think about the power that comes from seeing the spark in a student when they go from curiosity to sort of figuring out, um, you know, how to be a problem solver, that is incredibly powerful. Um, and the core tenets of invention education, you can see them on the screen, but we've got a lot of crossover here between the Chem Attitudes framework and invention. So if you're folding in context, you're folding in the problem solving, you're folding in these real world applications, um, a lot of that really goes back, at least for us at Beyond Benign, you know, we got really excited and could see these very direct lines that it sounds a lot like you're talking about the language of green chemistry. Right, um, and go ahead and you can switch to the next slide for me, Janie. So we see green chemistry as being a bit of a sweet spot in between a lot of the pedagogical practices um, and strategies that are laid out in the Chem Attitudes framework, as well as in invention education. So green chemistry, when you're we're getting at and asking those questions of why do we have materials that last 500 to 1,000 years? <laughs> you know, if, if you can get at having some of these, um, it, it's, you know, when you're when you're formulating driving questions and you're posing and trying to get students to to think more um, critically about about challenges, then this is for sure one way that we can then get to the other side and think about solutions. Um, and a lot of times we'll use the term science of solutions when we're talking about green chemistry because we see it as such a powerful way to, to think about at the very molecular level, you know, how is it that we can design our, our future in a way that is going to be less hazardous and gonna have far less of those unintended consequences if we're utilizing the tools to better understand toxicity and environmental impact from the very beginning and not trying to retroactively fix it after the fact. Um, so there is a link in here and we, we will we can share our slides um, with you guys after this too. Uh, the plan, the plan, yes, is to record um, and share this as a resource on our new Oregon Regional Hub site, which we will talk about at the end. But, um, but yeah, there, there is a tool that kind of does a little of these connecting. And so we thought that for our for the group tonight that it might be fun to do a little activity and, and get you guys um, you know, applying a little of what we're talking about because that's just much more fun than just listen to us talk about it. So we like to do over here in green chemistry. All right, Jeannie, I'm turning it back over to you. Sweet. Yeah, so exactly what Kate was saying that um, invention and green chemistry really have a place at the table together. So hopefully we've covered what is green chemistry, what is invention and green chemistry, what are they like together? And we're going to dive a little bit into the how. How do these two meet? What does it look like? What are the things that they create? So we have a game. Um, I'll share this link in the chat shortly, but you'll all gain, we're going to put you into breakout rooms. Um, the number breakout room you're in, if you're in breakout room one, you're gonna be on the first page of the jam board. If you're in breakout room two, you're gonna be on the second page of the jam board. They're all the same pages. It's just for your groups to work on them together. And what you're going to be working on is connecting the starting material, sugar cane, seaweed, or mushroom with the product it creates, the handbags, the Lego blocks, or the edible straws. I don't expect any of you to know these answers, to have them memorized. It's a thinking activity of what are these products could be used to make other things? What does that make our brain start thinking about? What else could be replaced? What else could be made out of more sustainable starting materials? So hopefully that makes a good setting. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can get you guys ready in breakout rooms and share this link with you in the chat so that you're able to open it on your own side. Um, I hope that you're all able to access it. Have you guys used a lot of jam boards before? Yeah. Cool. Oh, Kate, okay. I think I need to be the host. Merely a co-host at this level. <laughs> cool. 
Oh my goodness, I thought we did that before. Sorry about that. There you go. Okay, I'm just going to send you all out randomly into four different breakout rooms. Kate and I will bip bop in and out. Does that sound good? Okay, cool. All right, hey everybody. Hello. Oh. Amy, how are you doing? Good, how are you? All right um okay so are you guys in are you in the jam board in, mm -hmm. in. <laughs> i actually did this with my kids as we just finished the semester and this is one of the final tasks so we had the bingo and they had to then choose which one and then write a little bit about it so i know the answers <laughs> oh. <laughs> awesome. oh that is so great and Rami, that's exactly what <laughs> we, we want people to be hearing about is that <laughs> here are these different ways that you can be using it. All right. So which, because um, it's all just the same. So which page, I guess, which, which page are you guys on? Are you on one, two? They're all the same. So we can. Oh, gotcha. See all the jam boards. So. I went just realizing I think we were group two. two. Yeah. So I think we should be in Jamboard two because we're group two. Oh, so okay. so that makes sense, right? We'll, okay. we'll go with that. Um, so if you want to go, can you guys access it? Can you guys get in and draw, do the lot drawing, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Trying to draw. I, I clicked on a pen. Oh, I see somebody's drawing. Yeah. <laughs> Smiley face. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do the same thing. <laughs> so I don't know. Oh, there it is. It, it's very good. Oh, I see that. <laughs> that's right. So I'm, and I'm just going to sort of back away, give you at least like 30 seconds to kind of play. Um, and then, because we, oh gosh, yeah. I mean, you, uh, <laughs> see if anybody wants to go ahead and be brave and. It looks like somebody did. I don't know their name. So is any of these things resonating? I feel like it would be really cool if my edible straws were made out of sugar cane because I'm just thinking it would be really sweet. And if my edible straw was made out of seaweed, I wouldn't like it personally. <laughs> so. <laughs> I was just hoping to have a purse made out of mushrooms. I thought that would be cool. I thought that would be awesome too. Yeah. Oh, so the really neat thing, and now I'm just realizing like, oh no, Jeannie and I, I don't know if we talked about whether we can start giving the answers now or if we're going to give the answers after. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but yeah, like, wouldn't you want to go out and buy a purse that was made of mushrooms? Mm -hmm. I, I think so. My best guess is sugar cane to the handbag. That's Ooh. my first best guess. Okay. And then our prompt too was around like what problem is being solved. So if you think about it from that angle, I think, I think there's lots of guiding, like there's lots of ways that you can use a guiding question around this, like what are materials made of or what, but we sort of were bantering around of like what problem is being solved by these starting materials mm -hmm. going into these different products. Definitely eliminating waste. For sure. Yeah. Well, I think as a starter material, it would be like it's not a a petro based material. There might still be waste. I mean, there might be still leftovers, but maybe the waste can be less harmful in terms of toxicity. Yeah, and the, I mean, the, so there's the edible, edible straw, the biodegradability, you know, component there. Mm -hmm. um, but, but for sure, those starting materials, thinking about perhaps 
less energy being used in the overall manufacture. If you know, you could even think about life cycle um, of the product that would have, you know, the alternative. So if it's a biopolymer versus a fossil fuel based polymer, what's different in those life cycles? Yeah. So, other things that you can maybe think about. Repurposing a waste product. Mm, yeah, love that. Any other, any other thoughts on this one? Like. <laughs> I guess just also, you know, again, for, for you guys who are, are, who are teachers, like how else you would maybe utilize a, a tool like this with your students? We've got less than a minute. And we know. Inspire them that things can be made out of natural materials. Or just even like different options for building different things can get them thinking about like, instead of just recognizing like a straw as a straw, like thinking outside of the box a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And I think I think there's the, there's how to, to stretch, like the chemistry is actually about invention too. <laughs> you know, like it's like we, you can use these tools to create something that had not existed before and you could think about solving a problem in a way that nobody has has thought about before so welcome back everyone's trickle trickling in well the little bit i saw from each of your groups it looks fantastic i also love all the different connections people have made um is there any I feel like this is a bold question. Um, but from, let's start with group one. Is there any match from group one that they feel confident about and have an explanation for? Maybe not confident, but could guess about. Anyone from group one want to be brave? We were group two. I was in group two. So, hey, this is Miles Perkins from group one. Um, yeah, we, uh, I think I mentioned uh, mushrooms for handbags. Um, I guess I've seen it as a, as, a, as a holding structure from something else. So, that was a guess of ours. Yeah, that's actually the right pair. Um, that is awesome. I feel like Hopefully I framed this well, but getting the right matches isn't really the goal of this, but the thought process. So I hope you guys had some good conversations about what sustainable materials could be used, but you are right that it is the mushrooms and the handbags that go together. It's a company, Bolt Threads. They've been working in many different ways to utilize mushrooms. They do really cool things. Sweet, thanks, Miles. Um, group two, are you willing to wager a guess on one of the other pairs? I've seen an activity before where they've made straws out of Jolly Ranchers, Whoa. which made me think of sugar cane. So I've ventured to guess that that might be it. Ooh, it sounds like a really cool activity. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. That's not the- I haven't, it looks cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah, I like that too. I only know of these three companies I looked into, but that's not the match here, but I really like that idea. That seems cool. And it could totally be done. Maybe someone else is doing it. Anyone else willing to guess what the match with the edible straws could be then? Well, I suppose by process of elimination, <laughs> it is kiwi. Whoa, Bethany, you got it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm yeah. here all day. Yeah, Kate just sent in the chat. There's a company here. <laughs> who uses seaweed and makes them into a whole host of different products. Edible straws is one of the ones they're most known for. 
um, mainly just because edible straws are cool. Okay, group four, what do you think the last match is? Sugar cane and Legos. Yeah, woohoo, well done. Um, that is Legos making a new initiative that hopefully by 2025, they'll be able to transition to having biodegradable Lego cubes. So that's pretty cool. So thanks for doing that, everyone. I hope you had a good time um, checking out what's going on in industries. And I kind of want to zoom out and ask you guys just another question from here of why, oh, sorry, of um, why do these inventions matter? You know, what is the problem that's being solved by these inventions? Why are they being used out of new materials? What's the purpose of this? You guys can put ideas in the chat if that sounds better. What could be the benefit of making a straw out of seaweed instead of what it's traditionally made of? I might need Kate's help if anything comes into the chat. I'm here. Plastic takes over 500 years to, whoa, 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 I've already, there's already so many chats that I'm, <laughs> that I'm behind the eight ball. Um, less waste going into landfills, plastic out of oceans, leather. Um, whoa. Wow, we got, you guys, everybody's answering. Um, more of this cradle to cradle idea. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, and more. Less energy and processing, possibly. Less use of petroleum products. Yeah, we got some good stuff here. And leather requires animals. So, yep. The <clears throat> climate change connections on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Those are really great answers. And, um, for us, kind of where we see green chemistry and these innovative ideas coming together of utilizing chemistry in ways of how can we reuse natural products? How can we rethink of how things are traditionally done to be done in a way that's more benign, benign by design? Hopefully these examples and learning a little bit more about the companies helps paint the picture a bit more of what we're talking about. So thank you for taking the time and being willing to chat with one another and talk through this game. That's awesome, thank you. So I wanna transition a little bit more into resource sharing. One of the first resources I will share with you is actually off of this game. We have a match the memory for students and a lesson plan that goes along with it. There's six different examples of starting materials and six different examples of products that you can use with students. It also pops up all the videos and links of what the company connection is. Um, I just thought it would be useful to share because we just did something that was derived from this. So as Kate said, I can also share the slides with you guys right after, so you can check out all these links afterwards. Um, another resource I wanna share with you all is that green chemistry is being done in Nike, a little bit closer to home for you all. We did a nice spotlight piece on the program director of chemistry sustainability innovation at Nike, um, talking about the importance of thinking about chemistry in new ways and how this really has a role in using recycled materials in shoe products. There's a video here that's linked and where you can get to all of this is what Kate has already alluded to is this, whoa, I have it hyperlinked, but we get there anyways, of a K-12 green chemistry and education Oregon site. So this is specific to you all on what is happening in green chem um, ed over in Oregon. What are the specific resources that can be shared? This is something that we're just starting to work on. We're just starting to scratch the surface. So we would love to have any resources from you all or any more materials to share over here in teacher resources is where you will see the Nike spotlight. We also have some resources shared from teachers down below. There's virtual resources. Sorry, my computer's not too keen on loading right now with everything running. Um, but there's a lot of great things. There's also more resources at Beyond Benign of lesson plans that are NTSS aligned, ready to use in the classroom with student worksheets and the teacher background information. 
So I'll send the link to you all for this microsite as well. We really want this to be a place where teachers can come together and cultivate ideas of things that are in the progress or that they want to share with the network. So that's that. Anything to add to that, Kate, that I'm missing? Nope. No, I, I was just going to put the chat. <laughs> I'm looking to put the link in there for everybody so you can see. Perfect. OK, let's see if I can avoid the hyperlink now. And this is what I was supposed to talk about next, which I already did, of the Green Chemistry in Oregon micro site. It's a Google site. It's pretty easy to navigate on it. You will see what is green chemistry, why teach green chemistry, um, some testimonials from other teachers and resources for the classroom. In this same vein, there's a lot of different resources that are available online through Beyond Benign. I know Bethany was even just talking about them before. Uh, there's a lot of replacement labs. There's a lot of labs that utilize invention ideas that can be used for engineering in classrooms. Um, one of our labs that we do often is a replacement lab for Le Chat. There's also a really good one for EndoXO. So if anyone wants to learn more about those or has specific questions, feel free to reach out to Kate and I. Thanks. And Janie, I'm going to jump in here because we also do have, so for the folks from Washington, we um, we will have a microsite for Washington and that is, that is also coming soon. It's in the works. Um, and Pete actually added in here a really terrific resource um, that it sort of comes out of King County and it's the Rehab the Lab. So for anybody who is not familiar with that resource, um, it really is a terrific one. And he put the link directly in there. And yes, it's definitely, um, when you look for additional resources, we, we point to that often and, and it is, is wonderful. So, so thank you for putting that in there. Thanks, Kate. Anything else to add for the Beyond Benign Labs? Okay. I, I, all, all I can say is check it out, um, I, you know, and if you run across, you, you, you come up, you're stumped, some, you know, something, you get a question, like, please reach out to us. That is something that we very much love. And we love it when teachers reach out to us about with questions about our labs. Um, and we'll put you connect, in connection with other teachers that are using and doing, doing the work as well um, to help give you the, the best answers that we can about putting it into practice. Thanks, Kate. Um, another resource, which I don't know if I'm the best person to speak about this, but there's more resources from EPA for clean out materials and a management resource guide for school administration. We asked you all ahead of time if this is something you're interested in. So we really wanted to be able to pull through and give you guys more materials and information on that. Yeah, and I know David Skakel, um, and I know Lisa uh, is also on the line, but I don't know if David wanted to say something a little bit more about the school chemical cleanouts. I know he put something in the chat um, talking about because he works on the hazardous waste collection side um, and that, you know, again, engaging with schools via labs, lab cleanouts in addition to, um, you know, a four hour training is typically a lot of the ways that they work um, with folks. So, and I know we've linked in here direct EPA links. Um, but going back to the rehab, the lab and chemical cleanup resources there, th there's also some really great um, resources as well that, from Washington and um, Department of Ecology. And I know we've got Saskia Van Bergen on the line as well. And Saskia, it, like the whole Department of Ecology, we have a longstanding partnership with them as well, <laughs> in addition to Oregon DEQ. Um, and so building up the region of the, the entire Pacific Northwest is, is very exciting for us. And we do see that there's, there's a lot of interest um, and, it, and it's great to collaborate and connect best that we can. And just really quickly, Kate, Pete Pasters is on the call here and can speak to the clean out um, program if folks have questions. Does anyone have questions? Did I miss the explanation of the pie chart? Oh, the pie chart is we asked you guys before if you wanted to know about this and people said, yep. <laughs> 
Thanks, Dave. Yep, that was <laughs> that was it. When you guys signed up for this, we asked you this. Um, and I have Rachel, a new teacher, questioned how how my lab has been maintained. And I guess I mean one one thing that we can share too in our experience of working and doing um, workshops with teachers all over the country is that it's it's not unusual for new teachers to walk into legacy chemicals in their facility um, and the challenges associated with that. So this is a big part of why we like to partner with state agencies um, because they're the ones with the resources and the tools to be able to help with regards to you know having doing chemical inventories and and cleanouts. Kate, I'll just speak quickly to this David Skakel in Oregon, but again, I'm not a teacher. I'm on the waste side of it, but I totally see the value of it. And you know, I give a lot of credit to Dave Waddell up in in King County originally, but what a resource just push push, especially new chemistry teachers, because it's just you know, the mode is to start fresh, push all the chemicals to the back. Well, you know, and it's just decades of archaeology of old chemicals and pairing up a clean out that hopefully your state supports either way to get it done, paired up with a little bit of some of the, you know, what King County has a four hour class for chem teachers on how to do it right and better and greener moving forward. I think it's invaluable. Unfortunately, we have I have I have a grants program where we help. I, I did see one comment about working without a fume hood. I mean, we that's horrible, and we we have grants to help in our area to support the safety needs, safety first in this whole conversation about chemistry. Thanks so much, David. And I will say that there is, um, a, yeah, there was just another question about if there's interest in doing the the training. Ooh, oh boy, now, we, now we've got more. <laughs> we've got more people that are interested in that training that was referenced. Um, and so if, if Pete, maybe you could speak to that or David, like, yeah, in addition to, to, to that. And I'm just wondering, David, if that was in reference to the work that um, Dave Woodell, and, and again, I, I saw that Saskia put in here about how his videos are really fantastic. And I know we welcomed him at a workshop that we did. Um, back a couple of years ago as well. So, so there's good stuff. Um, yeah, I, this is Pete. And I guess all I'd add here is that uh, Dave Waddell has officially retired. So he is not, he is not a resources, resource that we can draw on for uh, instructional work. Um, he certainly is a resource that, uh, you know, still likes to uh, communicate with folks, but he's not out in the field uh, doing the work anymore. And that's a hard thing to replace. I'm sure there are other folks that have been working in this um, realm that uh, would be good resources. We just have to figure out who they are and identify them and engage them in some way. But definitely he left a good legacy of videos that uh, are not quite as interactive, of course, but um, are very, very entertaining and instructive. And I also found that Dave, and it's it's available. I, we have it if you need it. There's resources that are alternatives to any chemical that you that you can think of, green alternatives. So I think that's a good resource, especially for a new chemistry teacher, and uh, tied to a certain you know explicit experiments and so forth. Thank you, guys. Um, we will leave more time at the end for questions if more things bubble up and we want to address them. I just want to make sure we get through all the resources first so everyone knows all of the opportunities there are out there. But thank you everyone for really speaking towards how we can do more cleanouts. More resources are, there's more PD opportunities beyond benign. We have an online course. Um, we have an online intro course and an advanced course. The intro course is if you want to know more about implementing green chemistry, working together with a group of people, it's going to be hosted during the summer. Right, Kate? Yep. <laughs> um, and we, you can get more information from that on our website. You can send out more information on that as well. I know Bethany was talking about it earlier, so I don't know if you have anything you want to add in here. I just felt like it was really useful 
the assignments were really useful. The information was really useful. Um, I don't even, I don't currently teach chemistry and I still felt like I benefited from it. Um, and so if you are in, in the business of liking to get your PD with grad credits so you can move up the pay scale, I would highly recommend um, the online course Intro to Green Chem. And if you already feel like you've got that to take the advanced one, um, then I also would say, yes, if you're in Portland, the, sorry, my small assistant is really just also excited about green chemistry. Um, hey bud, can you hang for one minute? Uh, it's all good, Bethany. Uh, the, the, the STEAM tech teacher thing we're doing this summer is gonna be really practical also. Um, so, if you're interested, this is also me coming as like a teacher who's done it for a little bit and being like, yeah, get help. <laughs> don't, don't lone ranger this. Um, and that beyond benign's resources have been really helpful for me. So, and I'm happy to answer more questions when my assistant is less present. <laughs> so if you'd like to email me, I can put my email in the chat. I think that would be awesome. Thank you so much for sharing out. That's a huge help. And exactly what we were talking about. There's also another opportunity for teachers who are in the greater Portland area. Um, we're going to be having a sustainable STEM. We want to invite you to be part of that PD. It'll be worth one grad credit. Um, we have a form we actually want all of you to fill out at the end. And you'll see that it's one of the options to express interest in that. Um, we will let you know when more information is released around that as well. Anything to add to that, Kate? Yeah, um, I do want to say, I guess, circling back to the online course, that it is an asynchronous um, style, so do it your own pace um, type of course. And Washington, there are, um, for Washington participants, there there is a 50% um, sort of basically supplementary discount um, that's supported through Department of Ecology. Um, and in Oregon, I, I know that there, that you can also think about reaching out to your local ACS um, Portland section. They actually helped support, support last year. And so if there is interest, I, I know there's other ways that we can also, you know, anyway, there's, there's other tools out there that could help support um, in funding of it. But, but as Bethany mentioned, like it is, um, uh, we try to make it as affordable as possible and we want to we want to open the doors to as many teachers that are doing green chemistry as possible so there are even some you know we often have it, at least a couple of need-based uh scholarships that are available across the country as well so so please reach out um if it is something that you're interested in in doing thanks kate Ooh, sorry. There was one. There's a question in here, and I haven't d done the direct link yet. But I, um, I, I see this butterfly PT with a question mark, um, and so I wonder if that maybe came up when talking about replacement labs. But we have a Chatelier's principal lab um, that does use butterfly PT and is very vivid um, in terms of the color change. So, so. So yes, so I, I'm wondering if, if, if they wanted to maybe just know where you can find it, you can get it at Amazon, you can get it, um, you know, there's, it's actually easier than you, <laughs> easier than I thought, that's for sure. I hadn't heard of Butterfly PT, but um, it was other teachers who- I was just curious why you didn't and, use red cabbage yeah. juice or something like that, because it's gonna do the same thing and you can get that in a grocery store anywhere. So, <laughs> you know, so. But okay, I was just, I never heard of it gotcha. before. So. I gotcha. Well, and I think this is, again, just a, a little bit of a variation. And now you can talk about it through, you know, like you can open up these other other ways to talk about it. And I know Saskia is on here and I know she talks about it. Um, and actually even has been able to give it out to a few um, people at workshops. So again, trying to make it as easy as possible. So Ses, yeah, I don't know if you wanted well, to- One, one thing, um, so we talked about, and I don't know, you know, how people are giving out um, kind of kits to your students right now, but one of the things that I did with it was um, some trainings where we were sending packets to teachers and actually it'll be uh, doing a few of those again. Um, but we mailed packets and the Butterfly PT 
you know, it's really easy and safe to ship. And um, I don't know if you've seen it, but I think you're just saying it's a beautiful, um, looks like copper sulfate or something. You know, it just, it's, it's really nice to have rather than just the conventional black tea, this really beautiful color that just shifts, you know, into the rainbow spectrums versus like light brown and dark brown. Because a lot of times, you know, I think green chemistry does get the, oh, there's no explosions. It's like, well, there are still really cool things and beautiful things. Um, and so it's a really, you know, nice way to support the fact that safer doesn't have to be like boring. Um. <laughs> well said. Thank you. Thanks everyone. So I wanted to be purposeful about leaving a few minutes at the end for more questions. I also want to say, thank you for all the time that you've dedicated to us so far. We do have four more minutes for just more questions that are popping up. And I want to ask a favor from all of you, if you'll fill out this Google Doc, I'll send it right after I stop sharing, of just what you thought of today, what more would you want, what different types of training, and if you have any interest in the online course or in doing the sustainable invention training or learning more about the clean out, that would be a great place for us to learn more about that. So I'm gonna stop sharing now, open it up for questions and share this document in the chat. Sorry, Jamie, I, I did just share the um, Le Chalier lab direct in here for everybody too. Okay, there's a question about the trainings. There's two date ranges. Do we have an answer for that? Well, there are two trainings. I so maybe let's clarify, clarify that there are two trainings. Um, so the one is for the three graduate credit online intro to green chemistry and advanced green chemistry courses, which are asynchronous courses that are going to be run. And those are open nationally, internationally for participants from all over. And then Jamie was also talking about our exciting um, sustainable invention uh, course that is going to be specifically for teachers in the greater Portland um, area. And that will be offered. So that's the one that's going to be offered from like did I, I might have I might have even this is where we need to send out this information afterwards I have July 26th to, to August 9th um, for for that course so but we haven't put that one up quite yet we're going to start our hard press um, in terms of promoting and there'll be an application process for that particular course um, in that starts in March so from March to May we'll be you know collecting applications for that particular course So thanks for the question. Cool. I have one last final request for everyone and it is the cheesiest thing I always do. But if anyone who's comfortable with is willing to turn on their camera, maybe smile big. I always love doing a nice cheeky photo shoot of our whole community, especially since we're just starting to really connect with Oregon. I think it would be exciting. So I'll do a nice little countdown so you can all have your smiles ready, nice and big, figure all you so future you world. Jenny, while, you, while you're getting everybody all smiley, yeah. um, I know that David asked the question about, you know, universities. And so I'm glad that University of Oregon, yes, they had a very strong green chemistry program. And our higher ed program, that's the green chemistry commitment. There's lots more colleges and universities, 75 plus around the country that are signed on as green chemistry commitment signers. So whole nother exciting thing that's happening in higher ed. All right, Jenny, I love it, Kate. everybody's ready. Look at all these smiles. Three, two, one. Smile. Awesome. Okay, my chat went off, so I have to redo it real quick too. Okay, three, <laughs> two, one, smile. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank um, you. That was awesome. Thanks, guys. Kate and I can also put our emails right directly in the chat if people want to reach out or if they want to stay on the line a little bit longer. But I really want to be conscious of your time and what we've asked from you. We've asked for an hour and I really appreciate you guys being here for the whole time, paying attention and being great participants. So thank you so much, everyone. And we're really excited to see what else green chemistry can do in Oregon and Washington. Bye guys. Bye. I promised an email. Did though. Thank you.
Thanks, Kate. That was fun. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for tolerating my small colleague. No. So perfect. Yeah, bud. Can you 